Are you a mother, father or you are involved in caring for children? If yes, then listen to Ask the Pediatricians every Thursday by 10 a.m. for insightful discussion on popular child health topics such as dangerous child health practices, immunization, infant feeding, developmental milestones and so much more. You also get to ask questions on these topics and listen to answers to real-life child health issues by a pediatrician. Ask the Pediatricians Foundation is devoted to health education and information of parents and caregivers of children in the community to support you in raising healthy children. Don't miss Ask the Pediatricians with Dr. Bimi because it's informative, educative and interactive. Ask the Pediatricians Hour, the program for caring parents. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask the Pediatrician Hour. I am Bemi Salaboide. I'm a pediatrician, and I'm going to be your anchor for today's episode. Ask the Pediatrician Hour is a program where you can learn about important health issues that affect the health of our children. This program is brought to you by Ask the Pediatricians Foundation. Ask the Pediatricians Foundation is committed to the health and welfare of all children globally, especially in sub-Saharan Africa where majority of child deaths see happen. And we do that through our health education and information platforms, and also through our community medical outreaches. So I want to specially welcome you to today's episode of Ask the Pediatrician Hour. You can watch this program and even past episodes on our Facebook uh, page, Ask the Pediatrician Foundation Facebook page or Facebook groups, and you can also watch it on our YouTube channel. Some of you are, are also listening right now on Ask the Baby ATP podcast, and you can also listen to previous episodes on our podcast. Also, you can listen to us on Fresh Waves Radio, and you can also watch us on Fresh Waves Radio Facebook page on Thursday, 10 a.m. in the morning. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Whichever platform you're watching from, whether you're watching us live on our Facebook uh, page or YouTube channel, thank you so much for joining us. Whether you're listening on Fresh Waves Radio or you are listening on the podcast platform, uh, we really want to say thank you. Uh, for tuning in today and I'm sure you're going to learn something important because today we're going to be talking about something that sometimes people tend to overlook uh, you know when it comes to the health of children today we're talking about hearing loss and deafness okay hearing loss and deafness in children it was the word hearing day a couple of weeks ago and this uh a day set aside by the world health organization to create awareness about this topic of hearing loss and deafness and i felt that it's important for us because this is something that really affects children and this is something that can have impacts on their well-being uh and so it is important that we as parents as caregivers of children even for ourselves as adults as well we know about this important topic and we i'm sure we all know people who have some difficulties with their hearing or who are completely deaf and um the question somebody was asking me yesterday uh, was uh, one of her child has been diagnosed with moderate hearing loss and she's worried that she's pregnant now and she's wondering whether she's, this other child is going to have the same episode and what can she do to prevent it. And so these are the kind of issues we're going to be addressing in today's uh, topic. So please try to invite your friends, invite your family members to come and learn. Please share the links to whichever platform you are able to share it. So I'm sure everyone will be so happy that you are able to 
uh, share this important uh, topic with them. All right, so let's go straight into our topic today. Let's talk about the statistics first. You know, how, how many people are really affected when we talk about hearing loss and deafness. It was surprising to know that 5% of the world's population, that is 430 million people, require some kind of support for their hearing. So that is a whole lot of people, 5% of the entire world population are affected by when we come to uh, hearing loss or deafness. So you know, we're talking about people that really need help, you know, that have what we call disabling hearing loss. Because some people can have some degree of hearing loss, but it's they're still able to function normally. But we're talking about people that have the hearing loss to a degree that they need help for them to, to hear. And that is when we call it disabling hearing loss. And it's affecting up to 5% of the entire world population, 430 million people. And we're talking about uh, at least 34 million children, you know, this time around. So that is quite a huge, huge figure when we're talking about hearing loss. Many, many children are affected and as well as adults. And it is estimated that by the year 2050, 2.5 billion people are going to have some degree of hearing loss. 2.5 billion. I mean, the world is about 7 billion right now. So maybe I don't know what it's going to be in 2050, but that is quite a huge population of the world that will be affected by hearing loss. And at least 700 million of such people will require some degree of support for their hearing. So these are, these are WHO statistics, the World Health Organization statistics. So that means this topic of hearing loss and deafness is something that affects many people. That is just a, a summary. And we are estimating that many more people are going to have hearing loss because these days, the way our young uh, adults, the way they their practice of wearing their headphones, of blasting their music, is going to cause hearing loss as well because they are at risk of what we call uh, avoidable hearing loss. You know, a lot of people you see them, they're always with their headphone, headpiece on, and they, some of them play their music so loudly. And this is putting such, these are unsafe listening practices, and it's putting such people at risk of hearing loss, and we're speaking about one million, one billion young adults at risk as at now. All right. So I've just given us some statistics just to let us know that this is a very important topic. It's something that affects all age groups. So children, adults, of course, as pediatricians, we are more interested in the children. And then when we talk about hearing loss, you see me using certain terminologies. So some people can have hearing loss in one ear, but the other ear is enough for them to hear, or hearing loss, depending on the degree of severity, some people will have hearing loss, but they're able to talk normally, function normally, but some people have hearing loss to the point where it is a disability. It limits them in certain ways. So we call it disabling hearing loss. So hearing loss that is to the level where you can't hear what we call 35 decibels. So when we talk about decibels, we're talking about level of sounds, you know, um, how loud it sound or how quiet it sound has to be. So that is how the measure is. And so if you cannot hear a sound that is a Quiet has 35 decibel. I mean, that in the better years, then that means that person needs some help to be able to hear because that means person will not be able to hear normal conversational level of tone of voice, and that person will, will be classified as having disabling hearing loss. Um, and unfortunately, majority of people who have disabling hearing loss are in the middle and low income countries. You will know why that is because we are talking about detecting first that you have hearing loss. We're talking about help with hearing, like hearing aids and all that. These are very limited in the uh, low and middle income countries. So majority of people that really have this disabling hearing loss and they don't have access to the support for them to be able to hear, they are in, you know, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, uh, the low and middle income countries. So when we talk about hearing loss, I think we need to further define it 
Uh, so there's a level at which we hear, there's a level of sound that we are all supposed to hear minimum. And so if you are not able to hear at that level of sound where we expect majority of people to be able to hear, which we have classified as 20 decibel, then that means there is some degree of hearing loss, okay? Uh, so if somebody is not able to hear as well, as with someone with normal hearing, which is about 20 decibel or better in both ears, then you are classified as having hearing loss, okay? So that the way you will know that is that some of these children, you you, you speak to them normally and they can't hear, yeah, 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 I can't hear you. And then you have to speak louder or shout before they can hear, you know, most likely some of those kind of people we have hearing loss. So, or they cannot even hear soft, quiet sounds, you know. So that may be a sign of somebody who may be having hearing loss, all right. Now, hearing loss can be mild, it can be moderate, it can be severe, it can be profound, Okay, so people with mild hearing loss, they just need you to speak louder or shout a little bit more. You know, that's why you hear them saying, can you turn the TV sounds higher? But, but for the rest of other people who don't have hearing loss, the sound is loud enough. So why do you need it to be louder before you can hear it? That may be a point as to the fact that this person may have hearing loss. All right, so it can also be moderate, it can be severe, it can be profound. So there's a level which you classify. So let's say 20 to 40 is mild, 40 to 70, you know, moderate, and, and so on and so forth. But you don't need to worry. That is the work of the, uh, what we call the audiologist. They normally are the specialists or professional that test hearing and so they are able to tell you oh your hearing loss is mild moderate or severe and it can affect one here or it can affect both ears and in the, so when it is profound it is not like this your person can't hear at all no matter how loud no matter how much it is the sound is they can't hear at all so that is profound um hearing loss so it is important that we get that degree and sometimes some hearing loss can be temporary for example maybe there's hair infection there's water in the hair is what we call glue hair the person will not be able to hear but once the glue hair has resolved and all that then the person can hear so that is temporary hearing loss but sometimes people have what we call permanent hearing loss in other words we're talking about something at the level of the inner ears or at the level of the nerves or the level of the brain you know so some of those things are permanent you know is it's, it's the person only the person has that kind of hearing loss is permanent sometimes some of them can even be progressive in other words it can be mild now then it can go on to become moderate can go on to become severe and all that and so people like that we have difficulty with hearing normal conversations i'm talking now people, some people with hearing loss will may not be able to hear me if it is severe if it is profound and you know they can't even hear what we're talking about without some aids or some rehabilitation or some help which is what that that word means and that is what hearing loss means. that is why you see sometimes when we're talking we are putting some of the key points you know and these days we have a lot of what we call transcription automatically so that people that cannot hear at least they can read if their vision is intact so that is why we need to put that as a way to support those who may have hearing loss all right so there are a lot of terminologies so people will say um is a hearing loss is a hard of hearing is it deafness and you know it can be a lot of confusion that is why today i call it hearing loss and deafness because uh, i think it just has to do with terminologies and what some people prefer but generally speaking we use the term hard of hearing or hearing loss to re hearing loss covers everything but we talk about hard of hearing people will have maybe might to severe. So people that are hard of hearing, uh, they can see here, but they, they need some, they need it to either be very loud or they need it to, um, some help, some rehabilitation to help them hear. So might to murder. So those are the people that will benefit from hearing is something that will make the sound closer to them and louder and they can understand at that level. So we tend to use the word hard of hearing for such people, whereas we tend to use the word 
uh, deafness for those who cannot hear at all. You know, but again, like I said, it can be used interchangeably so people who are hard of hearing they can communicate most of them can still speak you know or they can do library and all that so they can still speak but with some help of hearing aids or cochlear implants or other you know technology can help them to be able to hear and all that so that is those who are hard of hearing Whereas people that are deaf people, uh, they have what we call profound hearing loss. So they have little or no hearing. And so those are the kind of people that rely on what we call sign language and all that to be able to um, speak. So that is a, uh, a more severe kind of uh, hearing loss. But different people use the terms interchangeably. So I've tried to explain to us what hearing loss means. Don't just for, don't worry about all the big grammar, but the most important thing is that people that have hearing loss or deafness or hard of hearing, they cannot easily hear at the same level when most people who have no more hearing will hear. So if they can be hard of hearing, in which case they need some assistive devices, hearing aids, cochlear implants to be able to hear, or they can be completely deaf, in which case they cannot hear at all. And, you know, they may have to rely on sign languages and all that to be able to communicate. So that is what hearing loss is. So we've talked about how common hearing losses, like 5% of the world's population is affected to one extent or the other. We're talking about uh, the uh what the definition of hearing loss is and the degree the severity of hearing loss we've talked about that now the next thing i want to talk about is what and i'm sure what this is the question most parents always ask why do some children have hearing loss why can't this be seen here what is the cause of hearing loss so we're going to talk about the causes of hearing loss we're going to look at the common causes and also it's also possible sometimes that we we never know why some people have hearing loss but so but let's look at what are the causes of hearing loss because people want to know what are the causes is it something that i can prevent is it something that is avoidable and obviously from my introduction you know that there are some causes that are avoidable like all the unsafe listening practices they are avoidable and we, we talk about them but of course there are causes that are not avoidable that we cannot do anything about so let's talk about so and there are causes that can start when the baby is in the womb, you know, when the mother is pregnant, uh, there are conditions that can affect the baby right from the womb, and that child can be born deaf. The child can be born with hearing loss, and that is why we talk about that when we talk about prevention and diagnosis later. Ideally, we should be screening all our children for their hearing when they are born. We should be screening them, you know, and I know that in some countries like the UK and some advanced countries, it is a routine thing that all newborns are screened for hearing loss. But in some places like Africa, low middle income countries, we are not yet doing that. And also there are some causes of hearing loss that occur when the child has been born already in the early phase, when there are newborn babies, growing up to the one-year-old period. And there are causes that occur when they are older children. And also there are causes that occur even for adults. So we'll look at all these possible causes of hearing loss. Now let's start with the causes that can happen in the womb, you know, when the baby is being formed in the womb. The most common cause around that age is genetic. So it's a genetic factor. And I'm sure some of you may have known people that in their family, they tend to have hearing loss. People tend to be deaf. And so some of those conditions are genetic. We have different genes. We have genes like what we call Connexin 26. You know, it's one of the most common genetic um, uh, cause of hearing loss. So people that have that particular gene, uh, they are prone to having hearing loss. And it can run in family. We have things like Alport syndrome, Alport gene. These are things that can run in family. So people who have seen family where the father, the grandfather, the great-grandfather, they are all deaf. They all have hearing loss. So it is genetic. And when we do the genetic test, we can quickly say, yes, this is the cause of the hearing loss. And some of these genetic can be hereditary, but it is not all of them that are hereditary. So there are also non-hereditary 
but genetic causes of hearing loss. Uh, I guess for things that are genetic, we have little or no control, right? Apart from um, maybe prenatal diagnosis and you can decide, okay, I don't want to have a baby, then you can test the baby another. But otherwise, we have little or no control over genetic uh, causes of hearing loss. Once you have that gene as a father and it's one that can be passed on to your child, then some of them are even what we call also some are dominant. In other words, every child is going to have it, or some are uh, recessive. They, it is not, it can skip some children, but it can run in the family. So if you have a family that they have that genetic tendency, then you're likely going to have hearing loss. And also we have other causes that can happen in the womb is it's really the what we call intrauterine infections. So there are some infections that a pregnant woman may have. And it doesn't bother the woman herself. She's, you know, she should just look like a flu or like malaria kind of illness, but it can affect the baby in the womb. And one of the things that, that those kind of infection can cause to the baby in the womb is hearing loss. So we call them the congenital infections. And when I was talking about prematurity and all those special needs children, I've mentioned them before. And this congenital infection, especially we call them with an acronym called TOCHES, T-O-R-C-H-E-S. Those infections, tosoplasmosis, cytomegalovirus, uh, rubella, uh, syphilis, herpes, and all that, they can lead to a child having um uh, hearing infection, especially the cytomegalovirus. Cytomegalovirus or CMV is a very uh, common viral infection and many people have it and they don't even know they have it. So they may have fever, they may have rashes or they may have nothing and they have the congenital infection. But if they have it in when they were pregnant, especially in that first trimester, it is possible for that infection to affect the baby in the womb. And one of the things it can do to the baby in the womb, apart from causing uh, jaundice, causing small head, uh, causing liver problem, is that it can also cause hearing loss. It can cause deafness, and it can affect one ear, it can affect both ears, and it's something that can progress. So uh, if that's why uh, mothers, when they're pregnant, we are very particular that you don't get yourself exposed to viral infections, to children who have fever, rashes, or to eating things like uh, car, uh, car, uh, exposed to pets, like cats and things like that. Sometimes they, they can get this infection from them. So you want to avoid those kind of scenario or eating on cook, not properly cooked meats and things like that. So cytomegalovirus and rubella especially, they are congenital infections that can affect the mother and the baby in the womb and they can lead to deafness. So these are things that can happen before you, the baby is even born. These are things that can happen for the baby in the womb. All right. So we talk about genetics. We talk about congenital infections, or uh, intrauterine infections. Uh, then another Thing that can happen that can also cause hearing loss is after the baby has been born. And now this one now we're beginning to have a little bit of control over that. All right. So anything, uh, any serious illness affecting the baby during that newborn period, it can lead to hearing loss. Babies that don't cry when they are born. So there's lack of oxygen to the brain. So we, we, we talk about that when we talk about cerebral palsy. So it is not only cerebral palsy that can happen to such babies. That's lack of oxygen going to the brain can also affect the inner ears and it can lead to deafness. So deafness can happen from what we call perinatal asphyxia or birth asphyxia. Also jaundice. So this is why when mothers see me screaming about jaundice, I see a lot of mothers telling me, oh, my baby has jaundice and they just told me to go and give glucose water or they just tell me to go and expose the baby to the sun. I'm screaming and I'm like, no, you don't treat jaundice that way. Luckily, most of us, uh, most jaundice are mild and most people escape, but you know, not everybody escape because if the baby has severe jaundice, one of the complications of severe jaundice, if it is not properly managed, is deafness. So it can affect, in fact, that is the one way we, by which we test to know whether uh, the jaundice is really severe because we see it's already affecting the eighth nerve, which is the nerve that is controlling hearing. That is the nerve that is involved, our cochlear nerve that we hear through. So severe jaundice 
can cause deafness. This is why you don't joke around with your John, with jaundice and newborn babies. If baby have jaundice, they have to be tested. We need to know the level of the jaundice. It is the level of the jaundice that can determine whether that child is going to be fine or not. Unfortunately, many people don't even go for blood tests. They just go and be giving glucose or purple water or exposing to sunlight. No. You need to test the jaundice. You need to see a pediatrician. If you see it and say, okay, this is physiological jaundice, no need to worry, fine. If we see it and we think this is high, we need to change the blood. One of the reasons why we change the blood, why we're so aggressive, is because we don't want that jaundice to damage the ear of the baby because it's going to cause hearing loss. So severe bataspecia, severe jaundice, Babies that are born premature, you know, preterm baby, low birth weight babies, most of them have to stay in the new newborn intensive care unit for long, and all those are also risk factors for, you know, uh, hearing loss. Also, all the infections that babies can have as newborn babies, like when they have meningitis, when they have sepsis, all those things can also affect their inner ears. Even the drugs we give to them, you know, some of our drugs that we give to these newborn babies, some of them can cause hearing loss. And that is why most time we check the level of the blood. And this is why some is one of the things you are going to learn from today's episode. You don't just joke around with drugs. Some of us are just, we just go buy drugs anyhow and use it anyhow. Some of those drugs are autotoxic. What that means is that they can cause hearing impairment. So there are drugs that can damage your nerve for hearing and so if you don't use them anyhow or use them not at the right dosage you're going to cause problems and so, see even with us pediatrician when we use some of those drugs we're monitoring their levels because we're like let it not get to the level that's going to cause hearing loss so that is why you don't just abuse drugs anyhow especially in babies so these are the causes of hearing loss. This is not an exhaustive list, but just to give us an idea of hearing loss. And one th good thing about this list, this perinatal period list, is that we have some level of control over this type, and these are the ones that we can prevent. It's avoidable. Jaundice is avoidable. Perinatal visa is avoidable. Uh, all the sepsis and all that, we can avoid them. We can do as much as we can to prevent prematurity and low birth weight as well. Now, let's move on to the next group. These are the ones that are called in adolescence or, you know, older child, older children and the adolescents. Ear infection. When a child is having recurrent ear infection or glue ears, it can also cause hearing hear loss, uh, hearing loss. And also when you have what we call uh, otitis uh, media, uh, glue hairs and all that, it can also cause hearing loss. And luckily for glue hairs, most of the time it's irreversible or it's temporary hearing loss. Uh, but if it's becoming too much, you know, we can end up having the permanent one. Also infections, this meningitis I mentioned that, that can affect newborns, it can also affect older children. This is why we give our children immunization. This is why we don't want them to have uh, meningitis and all that because it can cause hearing loss as well as part of the complications that these children can have. So we just want to avoid that all right so I, I know i'm talking for children but i just want to mention this in passing for the adults so adults who can have hearing loss so there are hearing loss that can happen when the adult is uh, in adults so for example um when they uh, there's some chronic conditions or diseases in adults that can make them to have hearing loss there are some age related you know so older uh, you notice some of our grandparents, you know, with age, the uh, the all the apparatus in the inner hairs, which I don't have time to be talking about right now, they become they tend to degenerate and they become stiff and other. So it can make them older adults tend to have hearing loss. It's part of the age process, you know. And then, of course, there are other illness and all that that can lead to hearing loss. But I'm not going to talk about adults today i would just focus on my children all right so these are the things that can cause hearing loss and there are other causes we don't call them causes but they are factors they are risk factors for hearing loss so in other words why, why they don't have a cause and effect uh link like like meningitis causing hearing loss or jaundice causing hearing loss there are other uh uh risk factors that they when you have so many of these risk factors and they can happen across all life uh from 
newborns to adults as well. So let's just look at some of those factors. You know, um, wax, when there's so much wax and it becomes impacted, it becomes uh, dry and, and solid, um, it can cause a block of the hair. Of course, that is something temporary because we can flush it out, but please don't use uh, cutting board and all those things because when you do that, you can actually puncture the inner hairs and you, I mean, you can cause additional damage uh, to the hairs of the baby. Trauma, you know, when people fall, head injury, and they have fracture of the base of the skull, and there's water flowing out and all that, all those things are also risk factors for hearing loss. Loud noises. Actually, for those of us who live in <laughs> very close to the to the to places i know that some places in nigeria you know these music people i don't know why they believe that it's until they bust their hair drum that they're going to sell their cassettes or their cds they are and some churches some mosques you know we we blast I, I, I don't know why we feel like until we make those noises for people to to to, to, to hear the gospel of the song to enjoy it no we're just going, making people deaf all right, that's what we're doing. Loud noises is not good for the ears. It can cause hearing loss, especially when they are exposed to them. I mean, consumers and some of you mothers who sell near those places, and I see mothers selling those places. Their children are staying there with them, and they are all dancing and enjoying it. The children are losing their hearing, honestly. So those things are to stop. And I remember there was a time Lagos government has to. You know, I mean, I think lock up some churches or mocks because of that in Nigeria, you know, because we, we are, we, some of us are very careless. We don't think that this thing is causing harm to the health of other people. We're just interested in, they're just interested in selling their own products and making so much noises. And some of our churches as well, most of, in other places, those when you are in those kind of buildings, you should be soundproof. In other words, people going along the streets, they don't have to hear all the noises we are making inside the big church building. And I remember there was a time I used to go to a particular church in Nigeria, and when I entered the church, um, even my children, they are covering their hair like, it's just too loud inside the church building. And I'm like, no, we're going to make everybody in the church deaf, and then we're going to start praying, you know, <laughs> for deliverance. So we really need to uh, factor that in. Ideally, there should be what we call health and safety, uh, department that's supposed to be checking all these things, and uh, so if you are one of you are in one of those churches, please please speak to the pastor on my behalf and let them know that we don't want them to make all the children deaf. We don't need to hear things too loud. It doesn't have to be too loud for us to know that people can hear us. And if you want people outside to hear, it's better we call them in rather than you know blasting the whole neighborhood with our noise. We're just causing hearing loss for the children. All right. So we need to solve that. Medication. There are medications that like like I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the new uh perinatal period, but there are also medications that can affect hearing loss. So gentamicin, for example, is a very known drug or what we call the aminoglycosides. It's a group of antibiotics. So your gentamicin, your amicacin, most of them hen in sin, sin, sin. Most of those drugs can cause hearing loss. Unfortunately, this is a drug that most Nigerian moms just go and buy. So their children have high eye discharge or hair discharge. They just go and buy gentamicin and start putting the eyes and start putting the ears. You can be causing hearing loss, uh, you know, because that is a autotoxic medication. It's a medication that can cause hearing loss. So don't just use drugs. When we scream and we plead and we beg and say, please don't use antibiotics without your doctor's prescription, people don't understand this is the reason why we, we are trying to sell parents that. So medications can affect hearing and can cause hearing loss. So avoid them. Also, there are some chemicals, especially people who work in some industries so there are some industries that they, you are exposed to certain chemicals over time continuously and those chemicals can also cause hearing loss these are part of health and safety assessment that those companies should be doing also some viral infections and other some of them don't cause hearing loss directly but persistent exposure persistent you know recurrent exposure to these things they are you know, risk factors. And if you have too many of them risk factors, you have to, uh, you know, the loud noises, you have the infections, you have the uh, drugs, you know, they can click together and that person is going to end up with hearing loss. And this can affect all age group, you know. So these are the uh, 
risk factors for causing hearing loss. So of course, like I said, uh, sometimes we investigate children, like one of my role where I work currently is to see children with hearing loss and to investigate them for the cause of their hearing loss. And I, we do all these tests. We do the brain scan, the hidden hair scans. We do the, uh, the blood test, genetic test. And sometimes we still don't find a cause for the hearing loss. So there are some hearing loss that we cannot explain, but the ones that we can, we try to figure it out and we try to address it. And what, why do we need to talk about hearing loss? What is the impact of unaddressed hearing loss? So if a child, even had us, if you have hearing loss and it is not treated, it's not addressed, what what is what's going to happen? Of course, let's start with the for children. Number one is communication and speech. If you cannot hear, you cannot speak. All right, and so that is why we, when parents come to us and say, "Oh, doctor, my child cannot hear. Um, I cannot speak. Sorry, my child is not talking." And all that. The first thing most pediatricians will want to do is a hearing test. We need to be sure that this child can. Yeah, and I know most parents say, oh, I'm sure the child can hear. Yes, there's a level you can hear. The fact that the child answers sounds or dance to music does not mean the child cannot, is hearing properly. So the child may be able to hear, but the child may not be able to, the child may have mild to moderate hearing loss. So maybe you have to shout and scream before they hear, or you have to be very close to them before they hear. They may be able to hear, but are they able to hear enough to develop speech? Or because sometimes they are hearing some parts and they are missing some parts. And because it's not flowing continuously, then they are not going to be able to um, speak properly. So whenever children cannot speak, the first thing we want to do is to test their hearing and to be sure they can hear because that is one of the impacts of hearing loss. So children with hearing loss and deafness, they struggle with communication. And that is why we also try to screen children early. We want to pick up the hearing loss early. We want to address it early so that it does not stop the children from developing their speech. Unfortunately, mostly in Africa, we only pick up children hearing loss after they are not able to speak, you know, when they're already two, three years old, sometimes even when they're in school. And so at that time, we will not only have to correct the hearing loss, then we still have to teach them how to speak again. So that becomes much more work. Whereas in advanced countries, where they actually screen the children, we pick up the hearing loss even before they are six months, six weeks, we've already picked it up. If they need cochlear implants, if they need hearing aids, everything is already put in place. Such children, most of them will develop normal speech or even with the, or sometimes even if they are struggling, we get the speech therapy to support them. So, you know, the, the, the deficit in their life is limited. But where we don't do that, most of our children are going to have like more disability because they are going to struggle with their hearing and then they're going to struggle with their communication. They're going to struggle with developing speech. So that is one of the impacts of hearing loss, such children struggle with the speech, such children also struggle with going to school. So, you know, in Nigeria, for example, if a child cannot speak, a child cannot hear, um, most of them are not able to cope in the regular schools, you know, and because most of those schools are not built to accommodate uh, children who cannot hear, who cannot speak. And so, there are special schools that, you know, we have school for the deaf, and I know we have some in Lagos and some in Oyo states and a few places all over, like, all over the country, but there are not so many. So there are lots of our children with hearing loss who are outside the school uh, environment because the parents don't know uh, to where to take the children. Some of the ones where the children are, they are overcrowded. Some of them have even been abused there. There was a very light large scandal recently about one of those children you know, with, in, in such school. I'm sure most of you from Nigeria, you know what I'm talking about. So some parents will just keep their children at home. Again, this wasn't their disability. Because this children may be very brilliant, you know, able to do everything they want to do. But because they are not able to go to school, then they're not able to maximize their developments and their potential. So these are the impacts of unaddressed hearing loss. Of course, even to adulthood, you see, some people who are hearing impaired or who are deaf, they struggle with getting jobs, you know, because some jobs are not uh, kind of, they don't factor in those who have hearing loss or deafness and all that, and they are not able to give them jobs, so they become uh, 
you know, what we call handicapped because it is it is not because of their hearing loss because they couldn't get a job and they couldn't earn money and so they now have to be depending on people. Whereas if they're able to, if their hearing loss is supported, then it can be anything they want to be and they don't need to depend on anyone so they don't have to be handicapped in a way by their hearing loss. And of course, we have social isolation. If you cannot hear, you cannot talk. Of course, it's so hard for you to, you know, interact with people uh, because um, you can hear what they're saying. You can, you know, interact. You talk to somebody. How do you have friends? How do you, you know, develop romantic relationship, get married, have children, and all that. Sometimes it's hard if if somebody has a hearing loss that is unaddressed, of course, I'm going to talk about how we can address it later so that those things should not be a limiting factor. So there should be no isolation. There should be no loneliness. There should be no stigma, you know. So there's a lot of stigma in Nigeria and Africa, especially about people who have hearing loss, you know. So there, uh, the World Health Organization has estimated that there are about uh, uh, the, 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 the cost, the global cost to to the world of unaddressed hearing loss is more than 980 billion US dollars. So that's a huge, you know, that's almost, another, I don't know what, uh, one trillion dollars, you know, that's a huge amount of money. And this is even excluding its costs, ex excluding the cost of hearing aids cost of educational support, special school and all that. So there's so much um, uh, there's so much that is going to cost the entire world for people that have hearing loss if they are not uh, supported. All right. So I'm going to talk about how do we know uh, those who have hearing loss? How do we manage them? Because I know uh, many of you are like, okay, so how do I know if my child has hearing loss? How do I know? So the way to know is, is that we actually don't wait on the people who think, you know, I think I have hearing loss. I believe we should be screening. Screening is so important. Unfortunately, this is something that is still not widespread, especially in low-income countries. And thank God for technology. There are technology that is trying to help us to address this issue of screening. We should be screening our children when they are born. In UK, for example, all children have screened at birth. Within two weeks of being born, they've already have their hearing check. They have newborn screening. And, and I, when I was working in Lifeline Children Hospital in Lagos, and we do screen our children there as well, of course. It's not so expensive. I can't remember, maybe it was 15,000 or 20,000 there right then. So there are places in Nigeria where your children can be screened at birth, but it is not widespread. Definitely it's not in our <laughs> government hospitals, but this is something we should be doing. So it is important to identify the children early, because early identification and management is key to avoid all those uh, impacts of unaddressed hearing loss that we just discussed. We have to screen the children. We have to screen them as newborn babies. We also have to screen them when they are entering school. So even though we screen them at birth, we know we will miss some people because most of the newborn screening is looking for moderate to severe uh, profound hearing loss. But for the mild one, we we can screen them in school age. So when children are starting uh, primary school, primary one, uh, reception, age four, five years, we should also screen them again. And this one is easier to screen because we, you know, because they are more cooperative, like unlike newborn baby, where we just use uh, some different form of method because they cannot respond. We just pass the sound through and see whether the sound comes out the other way. Though I'm just oversimplifying it. But for the preschool children, we can actually introduce the sound to them and they respond. So it's a behavioral testing. So we should screen our children at birth. We should screen them when they're entering school. And then people that live in places where they're exposed to noise or chemicals, they should also have what we call the uh, employment screening. You know, like those of people going to uh, police force and all that. Even when, we, I think when we started university, we were screened as well, if I remember, when you're starting uni. So screening, but for children, we need to screen them at newborn and at school age. And once we screen the children, and we think, they have hearing loss, then we send them to the, our hearing specialists or geologists. We don't have so many of them in 
Nigeria, for example, but we still have them. Most ENT departments, at least some of them do have audiologists who can do hearing screening. And I think military hospitals, some private places as well, you can go for hearing tests so they can tell. Of course, it's expensive, which is one of the limiting factors, but they can now do a more specific testing because screening is different from the confirmation. So they now do the proper what we call audiometry and they, and they can now confirm that the child has hearing loss. And when we pick up the hearing loss, ideally we should, the, doc, the children should be sent to a doctor, either pediatricians or ENT doctors. We can figure out why they have the hearing loss. If it's something temporary, something treatable, we can. If it is not, at least we can talk to the parents and you know tell them what we think is causing the hearing loss and we cannot talk about the measure how do we manage hearing loss so let's talk about management uh thank god there are not all hearing losses like sad news there are these days we have lots of uh, devices assistive devices and technology to manage hearing loss so we have hearing aids, so people with might moderate, severe, they can use hearing aids. For those who have profound hearing loss, we can look at cochlear implants. You know, it's, it's like the cochlear is the uh, inner, uh, the inner here. So the hair is better into what we call the outer hair, the middle hair, and the inner hair. And then, you know, so uh, we don't have time to go into the anatomy now. But that cochlear is actually this the where the sound is converted to be transmitted to the brain. So sometimes we bypass and put in an implant there. So it collects the sound and it goes into the inner hairs. So, but for people who might to moderate, we just need something to amplify the sounds. So hearing haze increase the sound. So it's louder, they can hear it better. Uh, cochlear implant is for those who have more severe to profound hearing loss. And of course, for those who cannot benefit from hearing haze, or hearing uh, or cochlear implants, or even in addition to it, we can use things like sign language. So those who are deaf, they have to find alternative way of communication. You can do sign language, you can do lip reading, we can do other form of what we call alternative uh, communication. And of, obviously we also, we have to be conscious of that, um, to make sure we caption things when we're speaking and all that so that those who cannot most people we check for their heights as well so if you cannot hear and if you can read then we try to use that method to also uh, support those who have hearing loss so having hearing loss doesn't mean you have to be disabled if we can give you you know, those supports, those rehabilitation, hearing aids, cochlear implant. The challenge is that those things are quite expensive. I remember a lot of my parents then, some of them have to travel outside of Nigeria to get hearing aids. There's a time, I think some of these organizations, I think MCN or some uh, council, one of the local, the wives of the legal state officials or something, sometimes they would do all this uh, charity thing and then they will give people hearing aids and all that, which is nice, but we really shouldn't wait until people do charities or events or foundations because the the, the amount of people that need this hearing aids, there are so, so many. There are a lot of people that need this and so we really wish the government would also step in and provide uh, support for people who have uh, um, hearing loss. Okay, finally, I'm going to talk about prevention because like when I was talking about the causes, you can see that there are causes of hearing loss that are preventable. Of course, there are some that we can't do anything about like genetic ones, but the, there are lots of them that are preventable. So we're going to, we can't end up this particular discussion without talking about prevention of uh, of um, uh prevention of uh children with uh prevention of deafness and hearing loss in children now prevention is so essential and it's best we follow through we can prevent even before the baby is in the womb and in the when baby is born and even as adults in fact in children nearly 60 percent of the hearing loss in children are from avoidable causes. Yes, they are avoidable. 60%, that's huge. So if you can present, prevent 60% of the, 
of hearing loss that are avoidable, then that means if the figure was going to drop significantly. And most of these things can be done through public health measures. You know, anything that affects a lot of people is public health issue. And the same thing for adults as well, you know, like all those loud noises that people uh listen to we need to make sure we reduce noise pollution in our country we need to make sure we don't just take medication unnecessarily you know so if we if we take out the loud noises if we take out using unnecessary medication that can affect that can damage the inner ears or hearing then we're going to reduce lots of uh hearing loss and deafness as well so let's talk about these strategies for children uh, number one, immunization. Immunization you, is so important. People don't, you, I'm sure you wonder what is the link between immunization and hearing loss. So things like measles, they can cause hearing loss, meningitis, so immunoflux influenza type B, the Neisseria meningitis, and the strep pneumonia. We have vaccines against all these conditions, and these vaccines, we have vaccines against rubella, and these are uh, Condition, uh, viral and bacterial infections that can cause hearing loss in children. So just immunizing your children alone, it's not just preventing those diseases, it's also protecting your children against hearing loss, okay? All those perinatal causes that I mentioned, even some of the prenatal causes like the intrauterine infections, they are preventable. So we need to make sure our mothers, when you're pregnant, you avoid getting yourself exposed to CMV, to rubella, to children with infections, viral infections. You know, that's why we don't want you as pregnant women coming into the nursery. And because children could be sick and they have this infection, it's not bothering them, but when it affects you, you may not be sick, but your baby is the one that is at risk of hearing loss. All right. And when you're pregnant, we want to monitor your pregnancy and later care. We want to make sure your baby does not have birth asphyxia. So delivery in a proper place. Somebody was telling me yesterday she delivered in a hospital. I tried to have help policy. She went back to that same hospital and the child has help policy. And I'm like, seriously, must you always go to this hospital? Okay, said there is something wrong with the practice in that setting. So don't go there anymore. Go to a better place. So the care of the mother, we don't want birth asphyxia. Your baby has jaundice, please. Don't give glucose water and proper water. You must see a pediatrician because we are talking about severe jaundice causing hearing loss. These are preventable. And for we can do genetic counseling even for the genetic causes. So if you know that your family, you are at risk of having hearing loss, you may want to discuss with the genetic doctors. Is this something you want to avoid? Is there a way they can test the baby before they are born? You know, how can they do it? And of course, if children has ear infection, we want to treat it quickly. We want to manage it on time. So these are ways by which we can prevent, um, you know, hearing loss in children. Very important. Of course, we need to have uh, those of us that work in places where there's so much noise and all that. We need to have a program for reducing all this noise exposure, all these loud noises, all those of us, those people selling um, music instruments and always blasting and all these clubs. All the, we need to, there should be regulation by the government saying you can't go about this level of noise in this place, this residential area, things like that, or chemicals that can avoid, that can cause hearing loss. We need to avoid them. Also, avoid loud noises. Don't always use all these earphones and you're putting it to the loudest. And, and most of those earphones, these days, when you're putting loud, they will warn you loud noises may damage your hearing. So they always remind you so you can tune it down. So listen to that advice as well. So. Uh, avoid medication, you know, unnecessary use of medication that has not been prescribed by a doctor. We are very, some people, especially in Nigeria, we are very guilty of that. People just go into pharmacy and just buy drugs. They, because somebody said, I use this drug, go and use it. People even give drugs as souvenirs. <laughs> I've seen all sorts on ATP. People are posting drugs and say, somebody came back from US and gave me these drugs. What do I? I'm like, seriously? Who gives drugs as souvenirs? You don't have to use drugs because somebody just buys it and because it came from US or UK, does that mean you have to use it? No. So these are things that could be very dangerous to hearing. And so we should avoid them. Only use antibiotics based on a doctor's prescription, not based on your neighbor's recommendation. Please, it's very, very important. All right, I think I'm going to stop here now. I've been talking about hearing loss. It's a huge, huge problem. And especially in children, it has massive impact on children. But 
uh, including it can affect the speech, it can affect school, it can affect education, it can affect employment in future. But if we pick up hearing loss through screening, we can deal with it on time. There are ways to manage it. The most important thing is for us to pick it up early and deal with it. But more importantly, we want to prevent it, okay? So prevention is better always than cure. So I've talked about all the preventive things. So let's make sure we get our children immunized. Let's make sure we pregnancy is monitored, delivery is monitored, complications in the newborn period is properly managed by pediatricians. If we do all this, we will be able to reduce um, a lot of um, hearing loss in children. But more importantly, let's get screened. So if you've never had a screening test for your hearing, uh, for your children, if they were not screened as newborn babies, please get them screened as even when they go to school. And now there are hubs online. The WHO is collaborating with some other people uh, to develop what we call low technology um, uh, resources that can help with uh, picking up hearing loss and all that as they are working on you know trying to make sure hearing aids are available so let's utilize some of these resources and let's get hearing loss i've seen people who have hearing loss who are doing fantastically uh well how doctors and all that so but they were able to get the right support and that is why but unfortunately lots 80 percent of people with need for uh, hearing rehabilitation are in low media, middle income countries, which means there's still a lot of people who don't have all these resources. And so we really need to work hard on prevention, more importantly, and why we work, why the WHO and the government and every other person is working on uh, rehabilitation of those who already have hearing loss. So if you have any question about the topic of hearing loss or based on what I've said today, you can always post your question on Ask the Pediatrician Facebook group from Monday to Saturday. Just put it there and myself and some of our professionals will be able to answer. Or you can email me at Dr. Bimi as Ask the Pediatricians does come feel free to join our facebook groups and you can always learn and you can join us on mondays where we do a live session of q and a so you can ask a question live and get immediate answer or you can keep listening on all the platforms where you're listening right now to past episodes and you can learn more so i really want to say thank you so much for joining me today until i see you again uh, next week with another important topic on in on the issue of our children's self. It is bye for me and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye. <coughs>